When we were talking uh, on the phone the other day, you said that the first Dickinson came to this country when, in the 1600s or something? Oh yeah, first Dickinson came to Connecticut from England in 1637. Oh. And then they, his son uh, came over to Long Island to South Hold, and then we went from South Hold, and my great-great-grandfather went to uh, Bridgehampton, he was a minister, his name was Nathan Dickinson in Bridgehampton, <laughs> And then uh, his son, who was my great-grandfather, was Phineas Dickinson I, uh, he moved to East Hampton and had a farm uh, alongside of Amy's Lane, which is right opposite uh, the town hall there in East Hampton. Oh. So uh -huh. that's uh, when we moved to East Hampton. And then my grandfather moved to Montauk, to Ditch Plains, in uh, 1890. And he had a farm there called the Ditch Plains Farm. And uh, my grandmother had a boarding house there at the farm at the same time. And during the Spanish-American War, when the Rough Riders moved out, well, like Teddy Roosevelt stayed at the boarding house there for a while. My grandfather was Peter Loftus. that had the store that was in the fishing village. He was born in Watertown in 1870 uh, in uh, New York State, Watertown. And actually, he ended up working for the Long Island Railroad and then slowly headed east. He was at Southampton and Bridgehampton, and this is in the early 1900s. Um, in Bridgehampton, he met his first, and met and married his first wife, Alice Carter, I think her name was. And my mother was born then in 1905. She died when my mother was very young, maybe three or four. I don't really know, uh, you know what the problem was, but anyway, they, uh, just had my mother, Alberta, and my mother and my grandfather ended up in Montauk, came here in 1911. He was still working for the railroad and he was the station master for some years. And then he opened up the, uh, the store that was in the fishing village. It was uh, Loftus and McGonagall. He had a partner. He was a World War I aviation ace. In fact, he had one leg because he had lost a leg in the war. And they ran the store together, but uh, mostly people remember that it was Peter Loftus that had the store. My name is Mary Smith Fulton, and I was born in Montauk in December 9th, 1915. And uh, I was the first uh, a baby that was baptized in Montauk. And my father was the first person because he hadn't been baptized. At that time, my father was in the Coast Guard station. In fact, that's when the Coast Guard was formed in 1915. And he was the youngest chief petty officer in the First World War. And uh, his name was Noel Smith from Amagansett. And my mother's name was Hilma Larson. She was from Sweden. She came here in 1901. And then when I was about, uh, well, I must have been four, three or four years old, my mother said to my father, if you want to sit in the Coast Guard and smoke your cigar, I'm going to build a restaurant. <laughs> and her first restaurant was built in 1918 out near Turtle Cove at the lighthouse. And it was built out of fish boxes. But of course, all the men got together and they helped Hilma to build this little restaurant. And she served a short dinner, which consisted of clam chowder, a salad, fish, corn fritters, and french fried potatoes, a cold boiled lobster, coffee, and dessert for a dollar and a quarter. <laughs> that was her <laughs> first restaurant. <laughs> and then in uh, 1925, that's when my mother built the wine danny. And then in 1926, she said to Albert Martel, he built the wine danny. And she said, Albert, I want to build an annex. So get a pencil. And that's how she built the wine Danny too. <laughs> Albert got his pencil, and the two of them figured out what she, you wanted. Isn't that wonderful? I'm Elizabeth Almquist Lane, known as Libby in Montauk. Uh, one, what, I was born June 23rd, 1922, in East Hampton. Uh, my mother came in 1898. I came in 19, let's see, I think it was six, 1928. Uh, wasn't very well settled, very, very not too populated. 
everyone knew each other. And uh, my mother was uh, a widow and uh, she had no profession, but she was more or less in the rental business and houses. And she was interested in real estate when she came here. My father was born in East Hampton in uh, 1904. And my mother was born in uh, Newcastle on Tyne, England in 1903. <clears throat> she came over from England in 1912 on the ship to Cecil with her mother and the rest of her siblings. My grandfather, uh, her father, was uh, already here working in the States. Got married in 1927, well, so... My father went to Fordham. Fordham. And how old was he when he went to college? 15? 16. 16? Yeah. He skipped a grade in high school. Mm -hmm. So he was already out of college when he was 20. And I think my mother kept the books at the meat market, the Gilmartin uh, yeah, my, meat market on Main Street. In, in East Hampton. In East Hampton, my grandfather. But they, they were dating in high school, I know that. Yeah. I was born in East Hampton in 1921, and I have the first birth certificate in the Incorporated Village of East Hampton. My father was Frank Flannery, my mother was Cecilia Brennan. And my father worked at A.O. Jones, which is now East End Hardware, and uh, he did a lot of uh, work with the fishermen from Montauk, especially during rum running days. Um, he used to sell rope and all sorts of equipment for the boats in Montauk. And we used to come to Montauk quite often. Now I hear that at your 90th birthday, you got a plaque and somebody gave a speech and said that you're the mayor of Montauk. Is that right? Yeah. Why do they call you the mayor? I don't know, I have one myself. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you moved to Montauk? Two years old. I have two brothers and one sister. And where did you come from? The schools, Canada. Nova Scotia? Yeah. What were your parents' names? Nellie and Eli Pitts. Eli Pitts. When you um, had your boat, the Captain Clancy? Yeah. That's when I was bootlegging. That's how I bought it. We used to unload the boats, and we made a lot of extra money. Do you remember any other famous people who came up there? Well, yeah, there was a lot of them. Chartered a lot of the Yanks. Did Marilyn Monroe go out on your boat? Yeah. Did you catch anything? Yeah, bluefish. Were you, like, really impressed, or...? Well, not really. <laughs> Typical Montauker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Montauckers are never impressed with celebrities. No. <laughs> but happy to take their money, nonetheless. We always are. <laughs> My mother was Anna Brinkman, my father was Peter Burns. My mother, I really never had one. She was had tuberculosis, and the only time I ever saw her was I used to see her in the hospital on Sundays. But I uh, came home for a week to die, and I was five years old then. So uh, my father remarried later, and after he retired, he built a home in East Hampton. My father and Bud King, who was in, from East Hampton, and he was a, in the liquor business, I, uh, they were married to sisters. My stepmother and Bud King's wife were sisters, so I'd end up, when bootlegging was over, he took his boat, he had a yacht then, and he made a party boat out of it, and took parties for a living out of Montauk, and I came down to work summers with him. My father was uh, Simon Henry Joyce. And um, my mother was Martha uh, Pettipaw Joyce. And uh, he had quite a few brothers out here. My mother was an only child. They came from Nova Scotia, Canada. They were here for a few years before I was born. That and, was when? Ooh, 1923. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, they were 
living in what we call the bay, which was a group of houses that ran along the um, Fort Pond Bay. And uh, in those early days when I was expected, my father was a rum runner. <laughs> I'm Sybil Toomer. I married Bob Toomer in 1949. I came from Massachusetts, so I've lived here for 51 years, two years. I've been here, let's see, since uh, 1922, and not born here, born in Bayshore, and, you know, just out of here for a couple, about a week, and then right back here, so I, I guess I'm called a native, even though you I wasn't are. born yeah. here. Sure, your, par <laughs> your parents were living yeah. here. Yeah, my parents <laughs> have been here since the early 20s, I guess, 1920, something like that. My uh, father, Walter McNamara, came out on the Long Island Railroad. The Long Island wanted to build up their uh, parlor car business, and um, they hired him to do that. And of course, the Hamptons was their most illustrious run. So uh, he didn't have too much money to do it with. So he went out and bought some rolling stock, some cars that were cars that had belonged to individuals, millionaires and, and presidents of railroads, that kind of thing, and tried to refurbish them and put together this parlor car line. And you usually rented um, a roomette or a drawing room or bedroom for the season. And there was quite a coup to get one of these. And then that was yours for every, say you took the cannonball, which left, I think, at 419 on Friday afternoons. My mother's name was Mary Jane Burke, and my father was Charles London MacDonald. And, um, and where did they come from? from Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, in Canada. They w were not married when they first came up. And my father was like 14, and he worked mm -hmm. for the Edwards in, in Amagansett and lived with, at their house. He was just a kid, you know. I guess his mother had died, right? Yes. Yeah. And because uh, we never knew either one of those grandparents. My mother came and she worked for her uncle, who was, who was Sam Joyce and had, where, that had his uh, place was where Gosman's is now. And this was the bootlegging days. And from what I could gather from my mother, she must have been a bootlegger's uh, accountant uh, <laughs> there. <laughs> because she was married in East people. Hampton at uh, St. Philomena's then, it was St. Philomena's, and told me that on her wedding day, they were having a reception for her down at my Uncle Sam's. and. They said, Mary, we hate to bother you on your wedding day, but we got some money you have to count. So she must have been the bookkeeper for, the, for some of the bootleggers. When did you come to Montauk? When I was a child with my father and mother and sisters and brothers, of course. Yes. What year was that? First time was a visit to my grandfather and grandmother in 1926. <clears throat> of course, it was as usual. My father's job brought us here. He was a carpenter. And uh, this was the promise of a nice long construction job, which in those days was very important. I do remember that we came out in a Willys Overland, one of those open touring cars, you know? You've seen pictures of them? No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that uh, when we got to Napeg, which was a cinder road then between encroaching dunes, uh, one by one the tires went. We had 10 flats. Uh, on the entire uh, trip from Amagansett to Montauk. Well, my father was a machinist and a mechanic, and the Montauk Beach Company was in operation at that time. They were building Montauk, and my father had heard of the opportunities out here, so consequently he moved the family out here. And I was nine months old when my folks moved me to Montauk, 1928, that was. And I've been here and gone <laughs> ever since. I was born in uh, Shepton, Pennsylvania. Uh, my father was a uh, mine superintendent there. 
and uh, he got minor asthma, and then uh, he was advised to move out of that job. So my aunt, uh, Ann Fallon, bought Trails End out here in 1926. She ran away from home when she was 15. Really? Yeah, and uh, she Your ended up in- Mother's sister? Mother's sister. Uh -huh. And she ended up in New York, and uh, the doctor who she worked for as a cook used to come out to Southampton. They had a summer home out there, so she used to work there. And she rolled into Montauk and uh, used to have a few pops and uh, ended up buying Trails End. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah, so she had called my father. He lent her some bucks. So when it came time to move out of Shepton, uh, this was the spot to come. So we came to uh, Montauk, yeah. <laughs> Were you born in Montauk? I was born in Montauk, wow. yes. Okay. And I'm one of the original Indians. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your, um, where you were born, where your parents were from. I was born in Southampton Hospital, 1929. Okay, good. I came with the crash. <laughs> and my father was born in Dixville Notch in New Hampshire. My mother was born in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. And you wonder how two people could get together. That's right. What was my, his name? My father's name was Clarence Martin Pilbro, but they nicknamed him Mike. Uh huh. So everybody knew him by Mike Pilbro. Mike Pilbro, yeah. Uh huh. And he came up with Carl Fisher. Oh, he did. From Florida, he was working for him down there. Uh huh. And he came up to help develop Montauk. Oh. What was and his job? What did he do? His job him? was uh, road construction. Mm. And uh, my mother's maiden name was Ina Susan Rompke. As a young girl, her and her girlfriend decided that they were going to come to the United States because of the lure of the big money. And they got a job in Shrafts in Brooklyn. Oh, no kidding, wow. And they had a friend that lived in Amityville. And so one day they decided they were going to visit their friend in Amityville. So it was two greenhorns. They got on the train, never asked, and they rode, and they rode, and they rode. And finally, my mother got up enough courage to ask the conductor where Amityville was. And he said, Amityville? The next stop is Amagansett. <laughs> she said, is that near Amityville? He said, no, girls, you got on the wrong train. Oh, no. And he said, and this train don't go back tonight. So they were bewildered, what are they gonna do? Really? So she said to the conductor, well, is there any place we can stay? And he said, yes. I know an old gent that has a general store and his name is Peter Loftus. Oh. And he said, I'll take you girls over there. Hopefully he's got a room left. And so they went over there and sure enough, he had a room and he offered them a job making much more money than they were making in Brooklyn. No kidding. So they stayed. The Scott family, that was your mom's maiden name, Francis Scott. Yeah, yeah and Scott. Your grandfather and then your uncle. My uncles. grandfather that was, all was your Scott. Mom's Scott. side of the family. Yeah, right? they, they, they all came from Jersey. Her father came from Scotland. He was a gamekeeper on Gardner's Island. Uh, Your dad's name was? Ellis Tuttle. And uh, dad started out with his father fishing. And at the time, I remember the first boat he had was the Lillian Sea. At that time, the dock, the dock down at the lake was opened up. And he used to keep it at Sam Joyce's dock right there where Gosman's is now. Is that a, was that a commercial boat or a That was a boat? commercial. Actually, how it became a party boat to the commercial, was the commercials. When they came to Montauk, they wanted to go fishing. So there was no boat other than the boats that was around the lake. And they uh, would just take the people out on, on a commercial trip. Marshal boat. Dragon, dragon, netting. And uh, that's how originally it started Montauk. I came to Montauk in 1935. 
the year I got married. Right. And I graduated from high school in 34, and the next year I got married. To Elisha? To Elisha Ammon, Ammon to right. <laughs> uh, but I was born in Amagansett, mm -hmm. and, and my, maiden my, my maiden name was King. Mm -hmm. And my mother's name was Mary, Mary King. I'm sure everybody has heard of Mary King. <laughs> and my father's name was Abner Martin King. Well, my parents were from Connecticut and New Jersey, but uh, I came to Montauk, first of all, during World War II, because my brother was in the Navy stationed in the manor of all places. And uh, my brother fell in love with surf casting in Montauk. So we started to come out on vacations for years and years. And then we finally bought, and I've been out here for over 30 years, uh, all year round. I'm Kay Maxwell. I came here as a teenager uh, in 1936 with my dad, and he'd go fishing. Uh, I usually didn't go with him. I'd stay on the, the beach and rent a bicycle. That was nice. And we came on the Fisherman's Special all the way down from Penn Station to here for $1.75. And uh, my dad would go out fishing. My dad was Daniel Whitelaw, uh, and my mother was Jane. Her maiden name was Jane Montgomery. And I attended schools in Yonkers, right up all through high school. Met my husband in Yonkers. We got married in 1940. And uh, before that, I had been coming out to Montauk, vacationing. and fishing with my father, so when we got married, Jim said, where do you want to go on your honeymoon? I said, where else? Montauk. I loved it. So uh, we uh, came to Montauk for our honeymoon, and we didn't have any reservations. Well, 1940, it wasn't mm. like it is today, believe me. But when we got here, uh, we didn't have any reservations, so I knew Tom Joyce, who was a local man and a right. fisherman. So I said to Jim, oh, we'll stop and see Tom. He'll know of some place where we can get a room. So when we got there, he said, oh, he said, stay here. He said, I'll move up with my sister. You don't have to go and find a room. So in the meantime, they brought my suitcase in and uh, Jim said, I don't know what she's got in here, but it weighs a ton, uh, Tom. And so they picked it up, and I opened it up, and somebody had uh, got into my suitcase, uh, unbeknown to me, and filled it up with rice. <laughs> but they had filled my nightgown and slips and bras and bathing <laughs> suits with the rice, all in the right places. And not only that, then they stitched it all. <laughs> uh, born in Ireland, County Roscommon, 1923. What and town I'm, in County Roscommon? Uh, well, it was a little village, a townland called Mantua. Then in 1949, I had to make a big decision on what I was going to do with my life. All my sisters were had left home, gotten married. Uh, my sister Una had come home on vacation from England and talked me into going to England to nursing, which she was a nurse. Right. So I thought that was not a bad idea. And then I had an aunt who lived in New Jersey, had written to me and asked me if I would like to come to the United States. So I had to toss a coin, heads for the United um. States tails for England, heads came up, and here I am. Isn't that interesting? That that's way. how I decided. That's, great. that's, that's a great how I decided. <laughs> on 4th of July, I arrived out in Montauk. Oh, you did? I came on the train, oh. my cousin, two cousins. Peg brought you out? Uh, her or, husband, Jim, Uh huh. and my uh -huh. cousin. Now, where did they live? They lived. They all lived in uh, New Jersey and East Orange. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. um, I arrived in Montauk. Uh -huh. No, Amagansett. 4th of July. 4th of July in Amagansett. In 1949. In 1949. Isn't that something? Never, that's wonderful. I never went back to Jersey. <laughs> never went back to Jersey. Wow. <laughs> you know, a lot of people do that, but you did it really quickly. <laughs> yes, I did.
Montauk Fishing Village, or Montauk Beach, as we called it then. Stretch from uh, Tuttle's, which is now Duryea's, uh, all the way uh, to the railroad dock, where the people lived on the beach. And uh, varying kinds of houses. Uh, most of them had running water, but most of them had outhouses. We didn't have indoor bathrooms, no. Sometimes uh, the uh, houses were equipped with a pump at, over the kitchen sink, so that you didn't have what we call, you know, faucets and things like that, running water, that type. But we did have it indoors. We didn't have to go out to a well to get our water. Yeah, that was that was a great help. When you first came, oh, when we you first moved to Montauk, there was a railroad dock that went out into the harbor, and it also was a place where the New London Ferry used to come in. Did the train actually go out on the that dock all the way? turned around. It was a turnaround, really? huh. rather than a turnaround where it is To now. load fish for loading fish? And they loaded fish there. Mm -hmm. And our house was almost next to that dock. It was a very modern house, you know, <laughs> outhouse and an old pump. Pump, a pump in the kitchen? Pump with a handle. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. And uh, most of the people in Montauk lived in the fishing village. Hmm. Uh, the fishing used to be very good in the bay. You could go, we used to call it called pin hooking. Uh, used to go off uh, Tuttle's dock and you used to take a pin, bend it over. Bend it over when you catch the fish with that? bread oh. dough on it and catch blowfish. <laughs> <clears throat> Before the draggers got in there, it used to be people would go out and, and uh, drop lines, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then it got to be quite sophisticated and they sort of kind of raised the heck with part of it. Mm. There used to be fish traps in the bay. They had uh, a couple, or well, maybe three or four along there. Where the they standing were, fish traps, yeah. Yeah, they, they were mm -hmm. like big Weirs, nets yeah. on posts. And, mm. and, uh, and then Duryea's, or Tuttle's then, and uh, the other docks, they had uh, holding pens like where they bring the fresh fish in and dump them in there. Oh, and they would keep the fresh and fish keep them in there. there till they got ready to ship them because you didn't have the icing facilities. Oh, there was another right. thing about Montauk that I remember, or suddenly remember about icing. We used to have cold w w uh, winters. I can remember it being ice as far as you could see towards Connecticut. Wow. Drift ice. Uh-huh. Fort Pond, we had ice boats. And when I was a kid, there, were, there was an ice house where the railroad turns around down on, the, there was an ice house there, and Duryea's had an ice house, or Tuttle's. And they used to store ice in there. They used to cut it, and they'd store it for the summer because that was our summer ice supply. We didn't have ice makers. And uh, they'd, the ice was so thick they could go on it with horses and trucks hmm. and cut this ice and bring it in. But it was very active down there. We used to hang around the docks. We had a, uh, a dock where uh, the big dock goes out on this side of Duryea's now. That was called Jake's Dock. And we used to hang around that dock all the time. We used to swim off it, fish off it, and whatever. And the boats used to come in and out of there. The boats would be parked right in the bay. In other words, uh, many, many of the people out here then were French-Canadian. So they were all fishermen. So they dock uh, more of their boats in the bay. They'd row into the beach by rowboat and then go to their homes. But when they brought their fish in at night, they'd go into Jake's dock, pull in there and unload their fish, and then he'd ship them and sell them. Those were different days. Yeah. Jake Wells, when I wasn't doing anything, he used to hire you for $3 a day to build fish boxes. Well, you got your meals with that, because he had a cookhouse down in, on his dock. Mm -hmm. And uh, you built, drove nails all day building fish boxes so they could ship fish in them in the summer. I guess that was pretty good pay in those days. Huh? Well, it was better than nothing. <laughs> Did Jake Wells have a lot of people working? Like when you worked oh, with yeah, him, was there like a count? He had, guys, he had, well, where Duryea's dock is, just west of that is where Jake had his dock. And that was the Montauk Fish and Supply Company. And he'd done everything Duryea had done. He had a general store there, too. Mm -hmm. And he had a crew, most of them from Canada, that were there all summer 
Some of it would go back to Canada in the winter. They didn't have too many doctors. I don't know whether you know, but we didn't have many doctors around. We had, my mother used to go nursing when she was very young. She was always interested in helping others, and she did quite a bit. Dr. Finch, who wrote the East Ham History and Genealogy, married uh, my uncle's sister, a sister in law So they, it was in the family, really. So Ma went out quite a bit with Dr. Finch, and, but in those days even RNs were scarce around here. And uh, I think she would have been an RN. Mm. But then of course she had her family to bring up and she, she went with Dr. Finch whenever, whenever he needed her, she'd go out on some cases. In those years, the doctors came to Montour. As a child, I had scarlet fever real bad. And Dr. Nugent came every night really? to Montour. Wow. And I think back in those days, they charged $8 to come from East Tampa. Wow. That was a lot of money, because they all took right. so much time to come all the way to Montour. All the way to Montour. Yeah. First, had to go down to uh, the railroad station, contact Dr. Lewis from Sag Harbor. He was our doctor, my folks' doctor. The, the depot at, uh, at the railroad station was the only telephone that was in the area at the time. It, if you had a message to go out, you had to go down, take horse and wagon, go down from the third house to the depot, railroad station, and to call up or whatever you wanted to do to get your message out. So my father would go down that way and uh, uh, horse and wagon and call up Dr. Lewis and tell him to come out that uh, uh, thought my mother was getting ready to have one of those children and Dr. Lewis, <laughs> would, Dr. Lewis would drive out with his horse and wagon from Sag Harbor and mm -hmm. would take him quite a while and he'd stay there for three or four days until the child was born oh. and, uh, and he'd drive back to uh, wow. to Sag Harbor after he got finished. For each? For each, for each, for each one of those children, yes. Yeah. The old school it became the old firehouse before it was moved. Uh, yeah, that's right. That yeah, was uh, that's that was the old school. school. Then, yeah. it went, then it became the firehouse, and yeah. then it moved. They, they moved it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's an apartment house. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And where was the school? The first school that you attended? It was uh, on um, Flamingo Road. Uh, on the old Flamingo Road, which was a winding road in, in those days. Yeah. But of course it was in back of one hill at the base of the manor hill. The old school was where the present firehouse is located. In 1929 the new school was finally ready for occupancy, built by Carl Fisher Associates. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to leave our old school. So I really started school when I was about seven years old. And the principal was uh, Mr. Hickling. And, uh, uh, Fran Parsons came, her name was Frances Cross. She was a school teacher with Mr. and Mrs. Hickling, and that was the three teachers. And then I went to school there until the new school was built where it is now. And then Mr. Farrell came because the Hicklings left. But it was, it was a nice little school, it really was. And, where, where uh, was it? Where very was it? strict. Right where it is now, our school. The one that we went to. Yeah, but the they've other. had several additions since, because they were just the four classrooms where the um, nurse's office is now was a principal's office the the teacher's room was the library and i mean we were it was strict oh Mr. talk Farrell. about concert. he was like he was worse than the nuns <laughs> but he was a good teacher and you probably learned a and lot and when you left there you know, <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't give you marks to get you out of school I mean, you stayed until you learn and I mean, Mr. Farrell had, he was famous for having somebody cross his knees, giving them a, you know, wallop. And we had, we, we all lived down in the fishing village then. And there was a kid that would come, when the bus came up, and somebody would run through and hold, hold, fish to the, uh, bus to the bay, bus to the bay, you know. And I mean, here he is, he's getting a spanking, right? He put his head up and tell him I'll be right there. <laughs> Mr. Farrell used to open up the bottom drawer of his oh, desk God, make you sit in and make you sit in there. That's uh. how he punished you. Until I think Eddie sat in and he was very heavy. I think that Did he broke, break the drawer? I think he broke the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. 
Montauk's a great place to grow up. We used to catch the bus down at Loftus store. And the bus uh, that you would see now on the road would be a mini bus. That's the kind of school bus came around. And there was only one, one bus for the whole town. One bus. I think he made two runs when he did it. And uh, the, Mr. Farrell, who was the principal, taught school also. He taught seventh Seven. and eighth. And when I finally got up to sixth grade, they moved his, that class in with him. So it was sixth, seventh, and eighth in the one room. Wow. But how many children? I think I graduated out of there with uh, 11, 10 or 11 kids. Yeah. That was a pretty big class. Well, the class after me, or two years after me, they only had nine. So they were really small classes, you know? And you got individual attention. <laughs> really? Really individual or attention. Or worse, yeah, either. whatever yeah, it was. Mr. Farrell. <laughs> Mr. Farrell, he was a tough guy. Uh, but his main uh, way of giving discipline was come on up and sit in the desk drawer. You know, there was no, and he was a big guy. Mr. Farrell was a big guy. And man, I was, I still remember him today. I was, I was still frightened him. I met him after I, I graduated, I got out of school, I went through, you know, I had a couple of years at Syracuse, I came back, and I became a probation officer. He was then teaching in Bayshore. And to that day, when he'd come out of that thing in Bayshore, I'd start shivering. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he impressed me. He was impressed. That's how he impressed me. One of the things that people who have been talking to have said that it was wonderful growing up here in Montauk. Yes, it was. Yeah. They had total freedom. I mean, they, oh, yeah. they were yeah. free to roam. Well, it was wide open. I mean, very, very few houses. Mm. Yep. Well, weren't they, didn't Carl Fisher 19, realize this? 1926, then he, then he built up Montauk, uh, and that's mm -hmm. when it, that's when that's it when really started to expand. Started to I mean, that's when he built those houses right. down there in Shepherd's Neck. and. Uh, Montauk Manor, of course, surf club, the surf club, the polo fields and the polo bonds, and, the, and they uh, used to have golf club, I guess, and the golf club, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they used to have polo matches down there at, the, at Deep Hollow, you know, at the polo field. They, 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 that's what those bonds were built for, or to house the polo ponies uh, mm -hmm. for the people to play polo. And, uh, when we moved out of the third house in 1926, that's when my father was superintendent. We moved to the point. Carl Fisher had bought most of Montauk then. He bought everything from the Indian field west. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't buy uh, land east of what they call the Wampanoag Line, which is a line that runs from the ocean to the bay just east of Deep Hollow Lot. Is that sort of east like drive? No, no, no it's east, east of, of that. East of, east of, east of, of Deep Hollow Lot. The, the property he bought uh, went as far as uh, the east boundary, the Hither Hill State east Park. Uh -huh. Hither Hill State Park and Montauk Point State Park were bought from uh, the Benson people in 1924. Oh, and so, they were in existence So they were in existence this. when Carl Fisher arrived in 1926. Mm -hmm. The state parks were still there, were right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me about um, on the Carl Fisher time, the, some of the people, some of the homes that were being built. You were still a young girl at that time, yes. at 26, 28, 29. Uh, anything that you remember at all? Before the manor was up there, it was a wooden structure. Uh, Mrs. Conklin, she had a lot of uh, people that stayed there. And then <clears throat> Carl Fisher came along and he talked her into selling uh, the uh, place to him. And he put it, uh, he took it down and that's when he built his Montauk Banner. Uh -huh. His idea was to have it one on Lake Montauk, one on the way to the point, and I forget where the other was to be. Four uh, manors, but the crash came, and, uh, and, and the people that were going to back him didn't have the money anymore to back, do any backing, so. The Montauk Banner was the only one that was really... The only hotel that was built? Yes. Carl Fisher put the inlet in in 1927, so until 1927 mm -hmm. it was fresh water. Yeah. And then my father, like I say, ran the first stock on Lake Montauk. Okay, when you say the lake, describe where in relation to today um, the dock was. The dock was located where... Uh, 
Gosman's would have their, the, the, the furthest end in. It was located in that area and uh, the breakwaters, breakwaters were not as long as what they are now. I can vaguely remember going with my father to the Fisher house, the big house. My father knew him very well. And in those early days, they did a lot of private gambling out here. So what they would do, he would go up and let them know if he could find out <laughs> that for, uh, the state police were gonna come out. They'd have it fixed where they wouldn't get out here soon enough to catch anyone that was gambling. Uh -huh. was, um, so you, your dad was in uh, personal contact with Carl Fisher. Carl Fisher. I can remember sitting in the car and waiting for him to come back out. He was going in to talk to him about the fact that they thought the state troopers might be out to try and close Deep Sea Club. Because oh, that, was, that was the gambling place. The next person that's in the history, I say, arrived by sea. That was my father, who was a, a Norwegian. He was born in 1892, and at the age of 14, went to sea, as they often did. He didn't get to Montauk until he was in his late 20s, but uh, he was in Miami Beach. By then, he was a, a, a captain, and he met a man, probably in a bar someplace in Miami Beach, by the name of Marshall Prado. He was Carl Fisher's personal driver and uh, chauffeur. And Marshall said, well, you ought to come to Montauk. Uh, and told him about Carl Fisher having been there, but he said, uh, prohibition's in now, and, and you can get a good job as a rum runner there. This is called The Confessions of a Rum Runner. And the gentleman who wrote the book uh, gave it to my mother, and she told, used to tell me that my father was in the book and so she found it and I finally had to mark it because he has disguised him. There was a rum runner named Will, a tall broad-shouldered fellow, lean and powerfully built. When a youngster he had left Denmark to seek his fortune in the new world and still spoke with a slight foreign accent. He had a strongly featured face a straight nose, a firm mouth, and a mass of brown curly hair, which he seldom covered with a hat. He had the far-seeing eye of the sailor and spoke but little, but when he did, it was to the point. As a daring navigator and astute rum runner, he had no equal on the Atlantic coast. And in addition to this, the luck of the very devil, and was as straight and honest as they make them. So everybody got involved in that rum running business because was, I guess there was a lot of money in it at that time. And there was a lot of boats coming in. They'd anchor off uh, shore here, three or four miles, and anybody had a little boat would run out there and unload those cases of whatever they were onto the little boats and then bring them into, like, come to Gin Beach, you know? And uh, they were unloaded there again and spread around to the bars locally or they'd go back to New York. And then when they got ashore, they'd hire some of the people around to unload it. And the guys that went unloaded would always manage to drop a few bottles here or there, and they always had the supply for themselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of the houses in the fishing village had cellars under their floor. They would store liquor. The house that we lived in, up until the time of the hurricane, uh, our parents bought from some, well, I guess they bought it from a bootlegger, but. And I can remember one of the bedrooms underneath the linoleum, there was a trap door, and that's where they used to hide the booze. Unfortunately, they never left any, I don't think, did they? <laughs> you know, you hear so many stories growing up that you feel like you were there almost. But uh, it was, I guess it was quite an exciting time here, you know. They used to go across Nap Hag, the cars that were had false bottoms in them, and they'd be carting booze off to wherever. You know, probably saw the mayor of New York could have his whole fix. <laughs> My father would have a group of men that would, where they would hide the, <laughs> the booze and then take it to wherever, whoever was purchasing it. Well, one incident came along. One man, which my father didn't trust because he felt he was giving out more information than he should. 
So the man called the revenuers, and his wife heard him, so she called my mother and told them about it. At that point, there was a knock on the door, and my mother had hid all the money. In those days, they had the cast iron stove, and they had uh, warming ovens on the top of the stove. She took all of the money that was going to be for the liquors that were going to be coming in, and she hid them in, in the roasting pans in the, and put covers on them. And the men came in. She said they told her who they were. She said they give the kitchen with their knitting. And she said, go ahead. I got nothing to hide. And with that, they went all through the house, tapping walls, looking in closets, and they left. And after they left, she said, <laughs> she said, and am I glad they didn't go near the stoves? <laughs> <laughs> My father for a while there, he trucked for, during the bootlegging oh. into New York. And uh, he told me lots of times about how they used to go to load it up, you know. At the docks? Would they load it off the docks or off the beach? No, they, it was off the beach. They knew when a boat was coming in. Uh -huh. And then he would bring it home and hide it in the gar our garage. Ah. And then take off for New York. Uh huh. My husband's father built a little, what we call Little Inn, or the Inn on Nair Pig now. Oh. He built that, and that was where a lot of the uh, people that were rum running would stop. And one of them was supposed to bring liquor to put in, um, that was the Tabor's garage in East Hampton. And instead, they got the directions mixed up, so they put it in the house across the street garage. And that happened to be the, a very devout Methodist person. And uh, he was very upset. It was a whole fiasco because they, he got the liquor in his garage and it shouldn't have been there. <laughs> but uh, it was, Emerson Table was heavy into it. and. Um, who else was heavy into it? Well, I remember the uh, men from Montauk used to come up and go to midnight mass, but they'd come up and go uh, go to confession and then come over to my house and uh, wait until midnight mass was time. And my aunt used to have a fit because when they came, they brought my father liquor. And it was always the best bottles of liquor that there were. And she would say, oh, those awful people, you know. <laughs> well, then she'd take the liquor the next day and go down the hook pond and drop it off the bridge <laughs> into the water. And I often think when they drained hook pond, if they ever found any of those bottles, <laughs> somebody must have found them. And of course, the women would drive the, well, Martha used to. Uh, now to, this is a Martha, Martha Joyce. Joyce yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They used to uh, store the money and the liquor in the oven of the, uh, what they call it, the captain's quarters down there at the dock. But, but a lot of the women were involved. They were the ones that would take the liquor up the island and deliver it. And uh, they'd take the back seat out of their cars and put the liquor in there, and then they could go take more. Rush Myers was owned by Joe Loris, who owned a restaurant in East Hampton right next to where my father worked, and that was a speakeasy, too. Dad was an unloader. He ran a boat that would go out, and come to find out it was a speedboat, and it would go right into Lake Montauk, into the boathouse there, where Mrs. Raymond's house is. Dad would pick the stuff off outside somewhere. And then they would come in and they would unload it over there in Clothing Shores. They would load it off the beach. And then it, during the night, everybody would go there and pick it up. I mean, everybody was involved with it, so it just, there was no law breaking. <laughs> <laughs> if one went, they all had to go. <laughs> and I know Clem, they had the dock down by the, where the old Navy dock is, located on the bay. He was on the boat and he had a, a sheepskin coat on, and the Coast Guard came off of Culloden Shores 
and started shooting at them. Well, they weren't hitting them anything anyway. And the guy just cut the rope on the boat. They had a lot of booze on the dock. And Clem was halfway between the boat and the dock, and he went down. And the only thing that he lost out of it, he got, he figured he got enough booze out of it, but the sheepskin coat he just paid for from Sears and Roebucks was still on the boat. He was worried about that. Well, there was places in Montauk, the Deep Hollow Ranch was used for storage. State Park was used for storage. Parts of the village was used for storage. Anybody with a big cellar seemed to store a little bit of it. I do remember my father and another guy right about the end of Prohibition bought a boat and they were fixing it up and they were going to go rum running. They were going to go out and meet the French boats out there uh -huh. and, run. and then the Prohibition was over <laughs> and they made a bonfire of the boat. Oh I no. Remember that. <laughs> and a little late, huh? A little late. <laughs> it was really an adventure to be in the fishing village. We'd drive over in the car and we'd put on a pair of shorts and take off our shoes and just stay that way. And I, growing up in the large city of Greenport, compared to Montauk, uh, I was just fascinated by it. And I hardly ever left the fishing village because by then the other village was uh, all built up and because Carl Fisher had already started his building. But I don't really, remember much there except being at uh, the fishing dock and always loving to go over. It describes the store at Mr. Loftus store in the old fishing village where meat was proclaimed the best obtainable anywhere was on sale. Lively dissertations on politics or old times went with the order. At one end of the store was the post office, I don't remember this, and Mr. Loftus was postmaster until the appointment of the incumbent, Ted Cook. Uh, in those days, the post office was in the fishing village, and the mail came in on a 7 o'clock train at night, so everybody would come and get their mail at 7 o'clock, and then we'd go across the street by the railroad tracks, and we'd play baseball every night. My father's boat, he, well, he was a commercial fisherman originally, and he started the charter fishing here in Montauk. Gosh, I, it must have been in the 30s. Was he one of the uh, first? I think he was, had the first charter boat here. Before that, if anybody wanted to go fishing, they got on a, some kind of a commercial boat, you know, I, and the guy would take him for a ride, and he'd catch a few fish, and that was it. But uh, nothing where people would come out as a group and uh, get on a boat just expressly to go for a Yeah, really, fishing. really, really charter the boat, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that was in the 30s sometime. I don't know exactly. I know I, uh, I mated when I was in grade school. I started mating for him, you know. And I got out of grade school in 36, so it, <laughs> it was sometime around in there. The Union News. Oh, God, yes. The that Union. was more fun, wasn't it? The Union News was on the bay, down on the bay, and we would go there. Well, I mean, we went there from the time we were little till even now. I remember going there to dances when I got mm -hmm. older, you know. We used to go down to the Union News, which was like right across the tracks from us, and we'd get all our ice cream and stuff. Uh -huh. The Union News was at the west end of the village, of the fishing village? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, those crazy fishermen would come out on the special, and uh -huh. they were jumping off the train before the train stopped. Wow. It was a rush in the morning. Then the boats would come back about three or four in the afternoon, and uh, they'd all come in. They had a bar in the the western part of Union News, of course. Boys would get a little half baked up and jump on the train and go back to back to Brooklyn or <laughs> New York. It was really huh? a building. Oh, it was a big building, uh -huh. big building. It was like a hall. Uh -huh. That's what it was. It was like a hall. Wow. And we used to go down there fishing on the dock, and we used to catch so many blowfish. And I got to be a real pro at it. I was a real tomboy. And I would give them the gurneys in. 
Right. And they would be selling them for a big price. Wow. And I, I'd be catching you, and cleaning the fish for them. <laughs> and getting paid for them, no <coughs> doubt. Yeah, my one uh -huh. uncle was a maintenance man for Gurney's Egg. Really? What was Gurney's like then? It was very quiet. There was no alcohol. Uh -huh. They were lovely people, Mr. and Mrs. Gurney. Uh -huh. That opened in 29, too. Right. Uh, Do you remember dances up at the manor or anything like that? that no, but they used to have dances down. Well, the manor was a different class of people. The manor had a, a lot of college kids from New England. A lot of them went to Boston College and those colleges up there. And they was our age and they'd come and work in the manor in the summer. And then they'd come down the fishing village at night to the bars along there. We had three bars alongside each other, which was Trails End was there. And next to them, it was Willard's restaurant. And right next to them was the roadside restaurant. So you had three bars where they could come down and drink and dance. But that'd all be the crew that worked up the manor. Do you remember the, the manor activities going on during the heyday? That was oh, our really? castle yes, on that the was hill. Like, mm. Beautiful. It's still beautiful as far as I'm concerned. That was yeah. always my dream, that someday I would live in the Montauk Manor. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, I mean, it's, it was a castle to us. You know, you look up there, and in fact, people come out here now and will say, what is that, you know, it is. It's on a the hill. beautiful, beautiful building. Oh, Shop. that was place was so yeah. active. Oh. When I, I, well, I was 18 and at that time, but uh, they used to have buses coming from the manor, taking the people down to the surf club and back all oh, this area like cars. every hour. Yeah, it was. <laughs> they looked like they had fancy. real, real money people there. I oh mean, yeah, talk about discrimination. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, the Jewish people were. Forget it. Well, that's the same as mm. Granny Sin. They weren't allowed mm. at the manor? No, I guess mm. not. Mm. No way. And at Gurney's either, I don't think. No. The East Hampton people uh, started to graze cattle, sheep, and horses on Montauk in, in 1658. Mm -hmm. uh, they received permission from the Indians to graze cattle there. East Hampton was settled in 1648, so 10 years later they needed some room to graze their livestock because they were running out of room in East Hampton mm -hmm. place. That's why it's called the oldest cattle ranch in the country, 50, uh, 1658, because that's when the, uh, the ranching out there really started. Right. In, 18, in 1660, they bought all of Montauk from the Indians for 100 pounds. I bought it from, uh, from Chief Weindank's widow and his son. They owned all of Montauk. They were chief of the Montauks then. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, without Montauk, East Hampton would probably not have been as prosperous as it was in those days because of the pastures. There's upwards uh, to uh, 5,000 head of livestock pasture on all of Montauk at one time wow. in, the, in the 1700s. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. That's, uh, uh, that's in the East Hampton Library and some of those old records there. Right. They had sheep. Sheep was mostly sheep, cattle, and horses. Sheep were pastured around second house, and cattle and horses were pastured around third house. And that's what I had always yeah, heard. Right. Shepherd's Neck, they called it Shepherd's Neck that's because, correct. Yep. because of the sheep. The yeah, sheep right. were there. Yep. 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 You would actually drive them from, from East Hampton all the way down? Right. And you participated in some oh, of sure. these drives? Oh, very definitely. Was yeah. that was? That's what I started, re restarted that cattle drive business in 1937. Oh, I thought 36. the cattle drive went from the railroad station. No, 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 no. <laughs> the first, they, first they went from East Hampton. Oh. Uh, Finn started in 1936, mm -hmm. uh, driving from East Hampton and, and drove local cattle. They weren't 200, probably 100 to 150 would be to tops in those days. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Drove them from East Hampton to Montauk. They pastured in deep in, in Indian field, and then they were picked up by uh, by truck in November. And the uh -huh. pasturage was always from about the first of May to the first of November. That's when the grass was the best. It took all day. It took from uh, we used to get up. The, I stayed at my grandfather's house there in East Hampton. We'd get up at four o'clock, saddle the horses, and drove over to a place called Roy Lester's where the cattle were penned. And we start about five o'clock and uh, uh, got down to Deep Hollow, 
oh, around four or five o'clock in the afternoon. You know. World War II ended that, and after the war, that's when these cattle drives that's when started. They that's started when they started from the railroad station. Yeah, that's when they started from the railroad rail. stations, right. And in fact, Finn used to burn that whole thing off, you know. He'd ride the crew there with his horse. This is before the cattle came. He'd uh, do it uh, in the spring, and he'd ride through there and just keep lighting it up, and the whole thing would burn. Burn all his... Uh, no ticks. Yeah, burn all the ticks off, and they'd burn all the uh, 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 beach grass and all that stuff down, and then it would come up nice and green, and that's where they fed the cattle all summer. They fattened them up. Well, yeah. all I can remember is that we used to burn a lot in Montauk, oh, burn sure. the hills, yeah. and it, we did not have a really oh, we never bad tick problem. We remember then, when you were young, the fishing village was still in oh, sure. operation. Oh, sure. In fact, that fishing village was demolished in 1938. I mean, the hurricane just took that. Uh, some of those fishing shanties were, uh, were blown right across the pond there, Tuttle's Pond by Perry's place. Mm -hmm. Some of those fishing shanties were blown right across the pond to the other shore. All that, that was all underwater. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I've heard that, that that didn't really put the end to the fishing village. No, it, it, it existed a little bit after that, but that was the start of the end. We were on the beach naturally then, and uh, we noticed the water kept rising and rising and rising. And I got off the beach with Hattie and, uh, Hattie and the Pitzes and the Burks. We were all in one car. You wouldn't believe it. The, the amount of us that were in the car, and we went up to the manor. But when we came back the next day to survey the things, we had lost our house. It was completely, completely destroyed. destroyed. Completely destroyed. And I will never forget when the hurricane came in 1938. My brother and I, of course, were in school, and my father had a dump truck. So he came up to get us because he knew it was a bad storm. And he had to literally carry one of us at a time out of the school into the truck. Wow. And we got home all right. Oh. And next door to us was a guy by the name of Carl Steinfeld. And he had chickens. And I looked out the window, and there's the chickens flying <laughs> through the air. <laughs> then the ocean met uh -huh. the lake. And, and the next morning after that hurricane, I have never seen so many dead fish because it killed all the fish in the uh, fresh water oh, pond oh, yeah. in Port oh, my Pond. Goodness, huh? uh, in 38, we had the hurricane and we were at the Wine Danny. And so uh, the, the wind started to blow and it started to rain. And my mother was sitting there in the, the Hell's Dining Room. And, all the shingles on the annex were standing up straight. And my father and the two guests, they were standing on the porch at the annex. They couldn't cross the road even. And we had two gazebos out there, and they just went flying in the wind. So uh, two spinsters, they lived around the corner, and they were both ambulance drivers in the First World War, and uh, Zella Demila and Ms. Lawton, and they had a bulldog. And, all of it, and Raymond had just nailed the, the door because it was bulging from bot, top and bottom. So he put a cro board across the top and a board across the bottom. So uh, I heard the banging on the door, and I said, Raymond, there's somebody out here. So he came, and uh, there was Zella Demila. Let me in, let me in. So uh, he took the boards off, and she says, phew, war was never like this. <laughs> Well, we had 14 people there then. So then pretty soon, I said to the chambermaid, by the way, is that young man up in his room? Oh, she said, I never looked in that room because that was on the side where there wasn't much water. And I said, you know, he went to the point this morning, and I don't know if he came back. He was in Pennsylvania. He came to spend a week with us. So I went up and I knocked on the door and he said, yes. I said, thank God you're in the room. <laughs> he said, why? I said, we've had a terrible storm. And I know you went, why didn't you wake me up? I said, I was so busy, I didn't even know where you were. So, <laughs> so then he came down, he joined the crowd. He slept through the most famous storm he had. <laughs> That's right. Boy. So the next morning, Zella Demila, uh, she went over and she got her car, 
and they went down, they came to the village. So they went up to the manor, and she saw the Red Cross flag flying. So she went in and she said, uh, what's that flag doing up there? And they said, well, we're gonna get supplies for the people with, and you know, all this and that. So she says, where are the supplies? Well, they're not here yet. She said, you take that flag down and you don't put it up until the supplies get here. <laughs> So down came the flag, Isn't and the, the supply yeah. got in pretty fast after yeah. that. <laughs> so. My mother drove over with a friend the next day because Greenport was wiped out also. And uh, she wanted to see if, if everything was fine. And that's the same time the other people have told you that uh, the fishing village was <clears throat> evacuated and everybody went up to the manor. But I remember my mother telling me when they got back, you could still see the watermark all over my grandfather's house. Uh, he lived, uh, the house was attached to the store. So the store was still standing? The store was standing. It, uh, it wasn't damaged. It was just water damage. And everybody, well, it said here back in this obituary that I, this is what I'm reading from, that um, Mr. Loftus set his store right after the 1938 hurricane left uh, the fishing uh, village a uh, shambles and continued in business there until 1943 when the Navy took over the, uh, took over the store. We rebuilt right on the beach there in the same plot. Plus the, the land we rented from the railroad, the railroad owned the land, and we paid $25 a year for the lease. But then in 1943, we got a notice that we had to vacate. The Navy was going to be using the bay for torpedo testing. So we had to move our house, which we did, up into the Upper Shepherd's Neck. The um, Navy took over the whole fishing village and the people had to leave there. And fortunately, the land was leased so that they didn't have to try to sell their property or anything like that. All they had to do was give the land owner, which was the, Mon the uh, Long Island Railroad mostly, the Tuttle family did own some of it. My folks leased from the Tuttle family and uh, move their houses or raise them or, you know, or just leave them for the Navy to take care of, you know. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the houses uh, were moved to various places in Montauk. Bill's uh, Inn, as we know it, was in the fishing village, is mm -hmm. that, as right. somebody said, mm -hmm. and then that was moved, moved to where it is today, right. which of course That's today is called down. the Windjammer, but it's Bill's Inn. Right. Do you remember how people felt about having to move? Were they oh, resentful they felt, or they, they, fine? Sure, sure they were, yeah. I mean, this was a whole way of life that was going uh, down the drain, you know, a whole way of life, a whole uh, fish, fishing village being completely uh, taken over. So the Navy could build its warehouses, its all kinds of things that they needed. It was a torpedo t t testing range, you know, and they had to build another big dock, which of course is a good thing, but, uh, uh, there was so much uh, going on there that we didn't know what was going on, except that the Navy needed it. The Navy was doing their war duties, and that was all we really and truly knew. Did you think you were going to get the village back after? or No, we realized that that was it. Yeah, yeah. that was it. 